good um all righty everybody welcome in promise scholars i hope everybody is having a great start to the day welcome to our first of our platicas poderosas uh, we will go ahead and jump into introductions and everything in just a second. Um, but I just kind of wanted to go over some housekeeping items for the Promise uh, Scholars and all of you in terms of like your requirements and your, um, you know, just the asynchronous PEO option that you do have, right? So we are going to be jumping into our uh, one of our asynchronous PEO options that we have for all of you Promise Scholars to get your engagement opportunity uh, done and checked out. Uh, and out of the way. Um, so this is going to be one of those opportunities that you have that you can go back, you can listen to, you know, you can, you know, um, have it as like a podcast style um, <laughs> and, you, you know, listen to it. And then also keeping in mind in order to receive the credit for it, you know, filling out, you know, your attendance survey at the end of it that, you know, we'll have readily available for you all. But other than that, in terms of your PSP requirements, you are all good. And I hope you all enjoy this little uh, platica that we have planned out for you. Yes. Yes, get comfy if y'all are at home. Get some cafecito, some pan dulce. I've been craving. Uh, mm. Yes, get your iced. It's it's hot right now, at least at, at the time that we are filming <laughs> It is pretty warm, but hopefully everyone's staying cool and maybe have your iced vanilla latte, mm -hmm. um, iced coffee. Uh, but hi, everyone. Bienvenidos. Uh, my name is Angelica. I'm one of the PSP counselors and really excited to be in community with you all today to start off our Platicas Poderosas but I'm so really excited to celebrate um, Latinx Heritage Month. Um, my pronouns are she for ella. A little bit about myself is I'm a proud first-gen professional, student, eldest sister, daughter. I identify as Latina, Mexican-American. I also identify as Chicana, which is more of like a political, cultural identity. Um, and really thrilled to be here with Manny with our special guest Martin which I'm excited to introduce um later but yeah really excited if we want to get into it Manny if you want to introduce yourself yeah, of course thank you Angelica I appreciate that um and you you mentioned get the cafecito the pan dulce let me tell you I, I had a uh abuelita iced uh latte the other day with like espresso what? It was the best thing ever. So if y'all ever get a chance to try that out, definitely give it a try. Wait, um, did you make this? Where Where did you get? Where? No, I went to a brunch spot. I I forgot okay. the name, so I have to check it out and I'll let y'all know. Yes. But it was it was good, and I was like, dang, that sounds like a like a good combo. So it had like okay. some espresso, the abuelita hot chocolate. Yes. Ten out of ten. Um, but yeah, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Manny. I'm also one of the uh, counselors here with the Promise Program at Skyline College. Um, he, him, a little bit about myself, very similar to Angelica in terms of, you know, I'm also uh, identify as a first generation student. So the one of the first in my family is to, you know, go through the community college system, actually a former Skyline student, you know, um, went through that, the transfer process and all of that good stuff. Uh, I also identify as a Latino and a proud Mexican American. So, you know, just really excited to be here with everybody and be able to talk about, you know, some of the things that I value and I find important um, and just the various different ways that we can be in community with one another, right? And, you know, share that space and, you know, I identify with one another. So excited uh, to be here and, you know, excited for also our special guests. Yeah, no, it's a special time, I think, to to share story, be in community, right? And I think that's what makes our cultura so special. Um, um, so yes, so happy Latinx Heritage Month, y'all. I think if we could go to the next slide. Yes. So we're going to start off with a bit of like a presentation portion just around like the history of Latinx Heritage Month. But for those that don't know, um, Latinx Heritage Month is celebrated every year 
from September 15th to October 15th. So this is our month and it's really about honoring our vibrant cultures, rich history, and all the major contributions from um, Latinx communities. So we're talking about folks with roots in uh, Latin America, including Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And we really um, want to shine a spotlight right to the diverse voices, stories, and experiences that make our community so special. Um, and those who've made like a huge impact um, as Latinx individuals and in shaping our culture. Um, and I think I, I didn't share this before, but parents immigrated from Mexico, right? When they were super young here to the Bay Area and both of my parents are from like the same ranch in Mexico. So I think it's really um, important, right? To really shine a spotlight that our community is really diverse, um, not just from Mexico, right? But from a lot of um, different rich cultures and um, countries. I think we'll yeah. that the next time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you for sharing just a little bit yeah. about, you know, what Latinx Heritage Month is and what it stands for, right? I think that a lot of the times, like, you know, to us, like our, our culture, our community, our background and our stories hold a lot of value, right? But to be yeah. able to see that it's being recognized on a larger scale is super important, right? Um, and you know, that's why I wanted to, sh we wanted to share a little bit about the historical background as well, because mm -hmm. it, it is very important, right? And it didn't just happen, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing ever just happens. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of advocacy um, and a lot of folks that mm -hmm. care to be able to get to this point, right? So just a little background uh, in terms of the history and its roots. Um, I know that I didn't really know all of this before going into and doing the research, um, you know, for this platica. But first and foremost, uh, it originated in 1968. Uh, as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon B. Johnson, right? So that was a little while ago. Um, and, you know... That was a long time ago. <laughs> it, it was a long time ago, right? Um, and it also goes to show the progress that has been made up yes. until this point, because one, it started off as a week, um, yeah. which at the time, obviously, was also like a huge accomplishment and, and a feat. But then it expanded to the month-long celebration under President yeah. Ronald Reagan in 1988. So like another 20 years, slow progress, mm -hmm. but progress nonetheless, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, for those that aren't really aware of what it is or, you know, what, what it celebrates, it does coincide with, you know, the, the Independence Day of a lot of Latin American countries, right, including Mexico, mm -hmm. Chile, Chile, and Central American nations. So in my opinion, it can be a celebration of several different things, but mm -hmm. at its heart, it is that, you know, the, the culture, the community, the, mm -hmm. the backgrounds of folks that, you know, immigrated to this country and are, you know, doing what they had to do in order to, mm -hmm. to, to make it. So yeah, yeah, just a little bit about that historical background, you know exactly right we were like now we need more than just a week um we got a month now but honestly it's like latinx heritage month is it's every day you know mm -hmm. <laughs> that we need to yeah. recognize um so okay so um latinx identity so we're using the word Latinx to really encompass a wide range of identities and experiences just because Latinx is more um, in terms of it's more gender neutral. Um, and the term Latinx is inclusive of gender identities. And again, wanting to note that for Latinx people, we are not a monolithic group, right? I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions that's out there, right? That we all share the same culture, language, traditions, but in reality, we are so incredibly diverse and encompasses um, people from heck of different countries with all diverse histories, dialects, foods, customs, norms, right? And I think that's the beauty 
of that, right? And I think really wanting to highlight the resilience, all the different contributions. But just so you know, we we I I've at least I've been using the word Latinx um, to refer to Latinx Heritage Month because of being inclusive to uh, all gender identities. Um, and I think that being a, a misconception, right, that we all are the same, right, or that we're all Spanish speakers, or, right, I think that we're not, again, we're not a monolithic group, um, that we all don't look the same, right, that we all come. Latin America is home to folk, like, Indigenous people, African, European, Asian, mixed ancestries, right, so I think there's no one way, right, um, that a Latinx person should be or look like, right, um, yeah, so I think here's to say that there's a wide range of experiences and identities. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Angelica, thank you for bringing that up. I think, especially, you know, when, well, there, there's not always as much awareness or conversations mm -hmm. that are being had as much as we would like, right? So a lot of the times it could be easy to, you know, think that there's just kind of one one particular like I identity or one particular path or culture or background, right? But the reality, mm -hmm. like you said, is there's there's just so much to it, right? So I think that's another mm -hmm. thing uh as to why like the celebration is so beautiful because you get exposed wow. to all these different things right and you get to have these conversations and learn a little bit more about not just your personal experience but the experience of others that you yeah. know while you might have a lot in common your stories mm -hmm. are still so different right um Very so cool. i you know, uh, another thing that we wanted to provide was just a little bit around like that language uh, and some mm -hmm. of like these identity terms that we come across. And, you know, for some of us, we might not necessarily know how to use them. Other times they might be like interchangeable at times. So <laughs> we, we wanted to just provide like that, you know, those definitions so that not only for this conversation, but for conversations that you have maybe in the classroom or in outside mm -hmm. spaces within your community, you can, you know, have though that language to really be able to, you know, um, ex express yourselves uh, about these different things, right? So first and foremost, and Angelica talked a little bit about it, is the term Latinx, um, which like Angelica mentioned, is a gender neutral, neutral term for people from Latin American descent, right? And I think the what we want to highlight is that this term is very in inclusive across all gender identities. Um, and that's why, you know, we've kind of been using it throughout like this presentation, because we do want to be inclusive of all who, you know, not mm -hmm. only our listeners, but, you know, all, all of the folks that are in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, Hispanic, uh, refers to people from Spanish-speaking countries or of Spanish heritage. I don't know about y'all, but when I was growing up, I used to get really confused, like when we would fill out like like forms at the DMV or like mm -hmm. the financial aid applications, and they would ask you like, "Oh, do you identify with like Hispanic or Latino or mm -hmm. what, whatever it is?" And I'm like, "There's all these different things. What does it mean? Yeah. What does it mean? Right? So." It, it's good to have like that understanding so that you could really speak to it. Um, Hispanic, like I said, refers to folks from Spanish speaking countries or of Spanish heritage, right? So it mm -hmm. includes Spain, um, excludes Brazil and other non-speech speaking Latin American countries and focuses primarily on the language. As opposed to like Latinx, Latino, Latina, that's gonna refer to people from Latin America, right? So Angelica mm -hmm. mentioned it earlier. Um, these Latinos, Lat Latinas, Latinx, they could speak Spanish, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of keeping those different like subtleties in mind and, you know, yeah. um, uh, awareness of like these different terms. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And I think like Latinx, I also want to acknowledge that it feels like it's more like in an academic setting that we use these terms, right? Because mm -hmm. Um, my parents are not referring referring to themselves as Latinx or um, even primos that I have, right, that are not in, in working in higher education. So it's very interesting, right? Yeah. And I think it's, a, again, we've been chatting that, like, a personal 
personal preference of like how you choose to identify. That's um, a great point. That, that's yeah, definitely so, a great point. Yeah, even like my parent, like when I mentioned to them, oh, Latina, they're like, what? Um, so it's just interesting, right? Across different um, generations or settings that we're in. Yeah. Um, yeah, one day I'm like, okay, Latina, another day Latina, like it's just, yeah, interesting. Um, so why does this matter? Um, so I think it was important to us to really honor and highlight, especially within Latinx Heritage Month, um, to really acknowledge that this is a month of like reflection, to educate ourselves, to celebrate, again, Latinx resilience, build that community, right? And I think it's critical now more than ever ever, especially when I think our communities are facing tremendous challenges, barriers, um, when a lot of anti-immigrant sentiments that label us, I don't know, right, like that we don't belong here, right? I think there's a lot of that going around right now um, that deny our identities, right? And I think now more than ever, it's important to celebrate, be outspoken, to really uplift one another, um, because we continue to be targeted, right, and used as, as a scapegoat for a lot of different things, but folks in our community continue to be resilient, hardworking, right, and really, I think, embody what it means to be a poderosa, poderoso, right, um, and I think um, that representation matters, right, and especially when we consider within higher education, right, that I think a lot of our students who identify as Latinx, Latinx in individuals, right, really may struggle to navigate these educational pipelines. Uh, but why is that, right? And asking ourselves what's going on there and um, also wanting to take this time also to shine light around like, what are the issues, right, that our students are facing, Latinx students are facing and really advocating for the support and resources um, in order to succeed. So I think it's a reminder, right, of our, our strengths and um, contributions, but also that ongoing fight, right, to, um, I don't know, to be heard, right, for, for equity, for equality, for representation, right, within um, higher education. And I think I, I think a, a lot about my own self, right, and my own journey. And um, I don't know, I think there were many times within my own education that I felt very maybe embarrassed of being Latina um I don't know I was thinking the other day of like during lunchtime right like in elementary school um I don't know like I remember being embarrassed like bringing my lunch to to, to school because my mom would like it'd be like tacos or I forget something like that and all I wanted to was like lunchables I don't know like right like I wanted to belong right I didn't want to be different um and it took a lot of I don't know right like taking classes learning about my history um to really feel very proud of my of my roots right so it's it's all that work right and I think that's why this stuff is important to really um bring about these, to have these conversations and reflect on our journeys and to undo, right, all of that kind of harm that we've learned along the way. Um, yeah. Yeah, 100%, Angelica. And I think that you bring up really great points, especially for our listeners that the majority are students that are trying to navigate these systems that a lot of the time, unfortunately, were made for, for people like us, right? And mm -hmm. that comes with its own set of challenges that comes with its own set of things that, you know, need to be learned and things that need to be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, addressed. And unfortunate, unfortunately, and that's the reality uh, of higher education that our our voices often get, you know, siloed off and, and, For and sure. placed into kind of like the back burner of yeah. You know, the, the conversations around like resources and you know what's important to the uh the institution but I think that conversations like this really highlight the strength that we have as a community mm -hmm. and as a people right um that we have made it and you know also highlighting the folks that have gone through it endured the challenges but come out on top so yeah 
So I think again, that kind of leads us to the Platica Poderosas, uh, Platicas Poderosas and why we're here today and really excited to introduce our Primera Voz Poderosa. Um, and I think again, we want to have these conversations um, and create space for sharing stories, building community, because we are not alone, right? You may feel like you are alone navigating, right? As a Latinx person navigating these different systems, um, but you are not alone and we hope we can kind of those consejos, right, that we can share with one another. And we want to spotlight people um, who really inspire us and embody what it means to be a voz poderosa. Um, and our hope is that this becomes more of a, uh, we take this out of this setting, right, and it becomes a source of empowerment and inspiration and and more connection, which I think is is always needed. Definitely. So with, without further ado, I want to go yes. ahead and introduce our first, uh, <laughs> uh, our Primera Voz Poderosa. And I want to make sure that I'm getting all of this because this is all important things and it's all amazing things that this individual has done and that has been a part of. And I think yes. that this person really highlights those things that we are are talking about, right? And can be that source of, like Angelica said, empowerment, but also someone that our students could you know, uh, look at their journey and say, okay, you know, I, I, I resonate with that. You know, I can, I see myself in that person, right? So, uh, our first guest is Martin, and Martin is a writer, an artist, and a community collaborator. Uh, born in San Francisco and raised in both the Excelsior and Mission District. Martin holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Saint Mary's College. Uh, where he also closely studied women's and gender studies. Uh, during their free time, Martin uses photography, poetry, and painting to highlight and celebrate raza and Latinx existence, beauty, and excellence within his community. Recent years, Martin co-founded Comunidad, which is a community network for Latinx identifying professionals at Skyline College, uh, which continues to expand each semester. And it started off as a space for campus colleagues to grow and develop uh, the Comunidad Student Club, student club which uh, Martin advises. In spring of 2024, Martin planned and hosted Sky Skyline College's inaugural Latinx graduation celebration. Um, and some of you may recognize Martin already. Uh, he does serve as the program services coordinator uh, for the Undocumented Community Center here at Skyline College, or otherwise known as the UCC. He assists with admissions and application processes, AB 540 affidavits, DACA and California DREAM Act applications, and also uh, mentors the Unlocking Future Fellowship student cohort. Um, amazing individual, amazing person that's doing great work. So Martin, without further ado, I'd love to you know, pass you the baton and, you know, hopefully you can introduce yourself a little bit more to our audience. What's up, everyone? Thank you so much for, one, having me join, letting me be in the space with you all and share it, um, especially on this really warm Monday. <laughs> yes. uh, my name is <laughs> Marcus. I go by he and his pronouns. Um, I've been working as the, um, as the UCC's program coordinator for about two years now. And it's been the most fulfilling role that I've been able to hold um, while working in the district. So with that, I've been able to, to just kind of see the UCC become what it is right now and just continue to expand and grow. So it's something to, to want to be a part of, but also be able to be part of that legacy, right, of whatever the UCC is able to turn into after that. Yeah. Yeah. You are an icon, Martin, and thank you so much for everything that you do um, for our students, but for, I mean, co-founding Comunidad, right, and bringing Latinx individuals um, to Skyline. I think so important, especially when you come in and you ask yourself around, like, also, like, where are the Latinx people here at Skyline, right? And the Comunidad um, to create that sense of belonging and community and, um kind of right for Platicas Poderosas and at least for me when I think about who is a, vos, a Poderosa, Poderoso, right? I think um, of people who just 
are on a, authentically themselves, right? And embrace their identities. Um, I think of my mom, right? Who's inspired me to be like badass, right? And, and wanting to embrace that energy. Um, but I'm curious, my thing to kind of start the combo of like, for you, what does it mean to be a poderosa, poderoso? Do you consider yourself already? Like, do you know you're a badass, you know? <laughs> um, to answer the second question, I think my Capricorn gets in the way where I don't. Oh my I, gosh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I mean, or whatever, but um, I think it's so awesome when that we have that word, right? That so many of us can identify with or at least identify yeah. very specific icons or role models or mentors right because yes. um, pero rosa or that word is just so like powerful already right it mm -hmm. like say it you already feel that energy you already feel like yeah. it's death right but the way that i define mm -hmm. it is just someone that is making things happen um yeah and mm -hmm matter what right because in every kind of step away of our journey whether that be professionally personally etc if you're still making it happen you're still you're still that powerful person right you know yeah many times you get knocked down no matter how many uh, doors close in front of your face um exactly. but even if it's out right um yeah like, uh, folks that identify with being latinx or Latina. Latin, we we go through this imposter syndrome at times, especially in educational settings. Where am yeah. I am I enough to be at this table? Exactly. Right. Um, or if I'm looking at my more independent endeavors and creatively, right? Like, can yeah. I actually create this, or will people understand yeah. where I'm coming from artistically? Um, so, just to kind of put it all together, it's just someone that's making it happen whether that be for, yeah. for their community, uh, for their loved ones, right? But especially for someone that identifies with being Latino, Latina, Latinx, uh, representation is needed everywhere. So uh, anyone that is just trying to continue to share that influence, that impact, that's how I would define it. Yeah. But how did you get there, Martina? I'm like, how did you, I guess, in your journey, right? Was there any um have you always it's the Capricorn in you I'm just like as a fellow Capricorn I know like hardworking individuals stubborn we get things done you know um do you think that was already something that was within you or did it take some time to build that confidence as you're kind of navigating through that imposter syndrome right sometimes that self-doubt I'm curious yeah um I think it's a really beautiful combination of both where it's wow. made, it, I don't think I saw it like in my earlier years of life where I was able to make things happen. I think yeah. I just constantly told no or just made, mm. like, like you said it perfectly, right? Being, being a Capricorn, very stubborn, like if you're going to tell me no, I'm going to say why now? I'm going to question it, right? Or yeah. out new ways to make sure that I can make things happen, right? Um, yeah. So. I think I was just a, always a curious teenager, um, especially mm -hmm. during the event, right? I think that's where a lot of it happened, where I didn't feel included um, on my campus. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel represented. I didn't feel seen or heard. So mm -hmm. I made sure that I not only found my spaces to feel that, but I made sure that my voice was always going to be heard, whether that be through public exactly. speaking, through my activism, through my mm -hmm. involvement. I found my voice like heavy in um, mm -hmm. undergrad years. And I think it kind of progressed and developed mm -hmm. by years, especially being a professional within our district. Yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, I think getting into the role of the program coordinator at the UCC, I never had to realize how much I had to be an advocate for students. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like I was always like, um, my advocacy was there to make sure I was supporting students, but it came full throttle when I became into this role where it just felt really, it, this community felt like ignored, neglected, um, exactly. represented, right? So that didn't sit well with me for sure. So I made sure that 
I was able to re resolve that, right? Or find solutions to no longer have the center where these students feel like they were no longer seen or heard. Um, yeah. You know, like I'm a little rebel on campus. I don't know if, um, if y'all may be knowing that, but I like to get into these spaces and yeah. kind of push back respectfully though, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. For example, like why can't we paint our office blue? Why do I have to choose, you know, manila yellow or beige? Exactly. We don't have windows. We don't have anything that is reflective of the sun or the sky, right? In our space. So let's make yeah. it lively. Let's make it lively. So mm -hmm. we have to go out to make it happen and getting a mural in our space to go out and make it happen. Mm -hmm. I still yeah. wanted to make it happen because it was so yeah. nice. It's not yes. us, it's for our students. And I think yeah. that's that representation that you're talking about, right? Of like, yeah. I think our campus sometimes needs that little reminder that not uh -huh. everything has to be decided by us, right? It has yeah. to be students, especially if it's exactly. the space that they occupy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think, you know, um, the students help me to, I guess, I. Yeah. I, I'm campus, so. yeah. And I think it's a gem. So I want to highlight something that you said. And, and I hope our students who are listening of like, yeah, like, there's going to be times where you, you, people say no to you, right? Things don't go your way, right? But it's how you pick yourself up, but also asking that question of why, right? When you get told no, like asking those questions that you have power to, right? Of like asking those questions why, but also opening other doors, right? And um, yeah, so I think that's powerful because, right, there's just going to be so many ups and downs within higher education within life right but um we can't let us be deterred right by folks that tell us no right and mm -hmm. asking those questions and challenging the systems that exist right that again we're not meant for latinx people to succeed in right within mm -hmm. higher ed yeah yeah 100 percent. i mean i think that it's an amazing thing that you know through finding your voice and through finding your power, now mm -hmm. you've become that outlet for others to be able to find that, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to provide those opportunities and, you know, because it's a hard thing, right? Especially when, you know, like we mentioned earlier, we're navigating these systems that a lot of the time, unfortunately, they're not created for, for our people, right? And oftentimes, unfortunately, like these voices do get silenced and they do get siloed off and placed into, you know, the, the back burner of what's priority and what's not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having individuals like yourself that are, you know, pushing back and saying, no, like I'm here and, you know, we're, we're going to do what we need to do in order to get what we need. Uh, that's super important and super valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and then through that example, others can then pick up the mantle as well and make mm -hmm. sure that that progress is, you know, is ongoing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd love to hear from you, Martina, as well, because, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, these amazing things that you've done, you know, and what you're, what you're still continuing to do, but I'd love to hear from you. Obviously, it took a whole journey to get to this point, um, mm -hmm. and I think that it's really valuable for our students to hear, you know, just how, you know, bumpy that journey can be at times as well. So I'd, we'd love to hear a little bit about just maybe some of those challenges that you experience as like, you know, uh, someone who identifies as, as a Latino and someone that went through not only the educational system, but also like these professional spaces, like, you know, what are some of those things that you went through and how are you able to, you know, overcome them? Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, I'll start off with the story. I guess like when I first realized that I was facing imposter syndrome even before I knew how to name it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I got, uh, you know, I was really fortunate to receive a scholarship to attend St. Mary's College of California. Mm -hmm. and, you know, without a doubt, my mom was like, you're gonna definitely go there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not, the first, um, not knowing that you still had to take out loans, right? But there was still a big amount of money that they were gonna be supporting me with in the scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. And even then, I didn't even feel worthy of receiving that kind of amount of scholarship mm -hmm. or aid, right? Um, 
my high school highlighted me um, through our like morning announcements and stuff that I think is so awkward. Like, why is this like being, you know, why am I being showcased? Right. Um, and it felt like other people were celebrating me more than I was uh, celebrating myself. Right. So yeah. I think I took that energy with me when I attended St. Mary's, but I felt it even more so because that's the first time I actually felt Mexican, but not in the right way. Like, I was mm -hmm. like, wow, I, people are looking at me really differently out here in Morocco, mm -hmm. out here in Orinda, they're like, dude, what are you doing in this town, right? Um, because at the time, when I entered St. Mary's, it was like this huge thing for the campus or the institution. Mm -hmm. We were the most diverse class that was entering St. Mary's at that time. Um, so I think it was a cultural shock, not only for the city, but the campus as well. So, mm -hmm. and you felt it, right? Um, I was like, definitely, and, and I'm pretty sure the students that are listening right now, it sounds like a cliche to them if we, when we repeat this, but I was literally the only Latino in many of my classes, right? And mm -hmm. that's where the imposter syndrome ignited even more, mm -hmm. um, especially when I would be, you know, trying to participate um, in discussions, mm -hmm. it just felt like my voice was kind of getting brushed around and not really mm -hmm. uh, received, right? Or there was no additional conversations or dialogue happening mm -hmm. with officers that would bring up. But there was one in particular situation that happened, and this was, mind you, this was maybe the end of my freshman, first, first semester of freshman year. We had this thing called seminar, and where you, you're essentially just read, reading and discussing with your classmates, right? Um, but we were mainly just reading Western authors, um, European mm -hmm. authors. Right? And for me, um, I'm pretty outspoken already, but I was yeah. kind of tired of the same themes, right? Um, mm -hmm. And there we were reading about uh, an European nun, and I brought it up, like I brought it up how, you know, I feel like women today are still, in a sense, can relate to this, right? Um, to this kind of oppression, uh, treatment of silencing their voices, mm -hmm. or having to be, you know, finding out new avenues to make sure that their voices are being expressed. And I said, but I'm curious as to, how this can relate to women of color. And I'm, mm -hmm. and as I kind of make this argument, right, one of my fellow classmates said, God, dude, do you ever shut up? You always want to talk about race. And I was mm -hmm. just completely like, just shocked. Like, I can't believe this happened right now. You know, like, mm -hmm. one, again, like I said, I'm the only Latino in my, in my room. Mm -hmm. A bunch of athletes, no Tino shit of athletes, right? But it was mainly mm -hmm. like, tennis players, et cetera. Yeah. And I look at my um my instructor like, yo, are you gonna say anything or what? Like, what? How? Am I, what am I supposed yeah. to do? Right. Not only am I livid, am I humiliated, but now again, I had to keep my composure though. And yeah, exactly. You know, long pause for sure in the class, but I say, you know what, dude? Right now, I will shut up. But I promise you, one day you're gonna see my name in books. You're gonna see my name everywhere, and you're never gonna shut me up again. And yeah. um, you know, we never really interacted after that. But that's what influenced um, this first tattoo I got, and it says "Abba la verdad." And mm. you know, I think a lot of people I use it for people, yeah. but I got "Speak the Truth" in Spanish because, like, you're not gonna shush me, like. Yeah. I'm just, my resistance to like always oh, speak my truth right and being able to remember my voice so yeah. uh, long story but that's what definitely you know it blew me up on campus where i just started being extremely resilient um mm. and there. like i said if people are going to treat me like this like i'm gonna go wild on campus and i'm gonna just cause hell yeah. And, so. and a lot of underground uh, art, but like activism, like at three in the morning with my best family, we would put flyers everywhere. We would like, you know, call out administration, um, yeah. demanding more uh, POC faculty members. Um, we were just making it happen. And you yeah. know, I think I had to go through that moment as a freshman to really ignite this, right? To really yeah. discover my voice in that setting. Yeah. And after that too, 
that's when I started to present or not present, but perform every month at an open mic that we had on campus. Yeah. And that's where the poetry also developed. So mm -hmm. um I I hope I answered the question, Manny. I felt like yeah. I wanted to change it, but you know, oh, yeah. I think it's, that's what happened in my undergrad years. And then, but that's, I always remember that story because that's where it made me face and challenge my own imposter syndrome and reclaim myself, right? Mm -hmm. Reclaim my, reclaim my, my, my entity, my energy in these spaces where I don't feel welcomed. And mm -hmm. thankfully it hasn't really happened like that professionally. I think this yeah. self-doubt is what I'm, mm -hmm. what I've had a battle in higher education, right? Like, mm -hmm. why is mm -hmm. it so long to discover or to, to really commit to a master's program, right? Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. I've been navigating through, but mm -hmm. the last phases of it, right? So I can now, because I need to continue education. Mm -hmm. I have to yeah. trying to uh, be fulfilled in and um, get involved with. So I, it, it, it it's just unfortunate that it's in waves, right? And I, I want to be really, real with students that are listening or who can resonate but we if if you do feel it you know i felt it but it comes mm -hmm. in waves like you think you yeah. like, beat it one level or one stage of it but it comes at you in another way but the beauty of it right is that you figure out your ways to navigate through it but yeah. stronger and i hope that doesn't sound corny with the folks are really like repetitive but it does right like you do figure mm -hmm. out new, you discover new new layers about yourself new yeah. power new powers about yourself you know what i mean and yeah. that's the beautiful journey of it all like when you have to really rediscover who you are and your purpose and how you can make things happen for yourself again mm. oh, definitely and I, I really appreciate you sharing that story because i mean obviously like that was a life experience that you went through um mm -hmm. that you know really shaped you know, like the person that you are now, right? It sounds like a very impactful, but also pivotal moment in your life. And mm -hmm. I think when we think about it, right, like even these, what seem mi like minor things while they're happening in the moment, they could have major implications for, for the future and for who we are going to be as people, right? And, you know, just a little follow up to the question, because I think it's really important for our listeners to, you know, just maybe have uh, a, a little bit better understanding because I'm sure like a lot of our students, especially the ones listening now, have either experienced something like that or may experience something like that in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a couple of different ways that you could take it, right? You can, one, take that experience and become or or make it something that, that drives you mm -hmm. or at or also it can be something that really discourages you. So I'd love to hear, mm -hmm. Martin, like what, what would be like a consejo that you would tell students, um, you know, that maybe have gone through something like that or, you know, mm -hmm. potentially could, um, you know, I, and I mean, like, especially in higher education, like that's the unfortunate reality that we live in that, you know, even like myself, I've gone through some things with not just other students and, and colleagues, but also, you know, uh instructors and you know I've heard mm -hmm. things that have made me question my you know my worth and my my ability to be successful so yeah I just love to hear if you have like a little words of advice or concept or something to encourage folks that you know have experience or will yeah um I think that's a big one right uh I because I always think back to those moments and I have and I had too many moments out there in Malaga and Orindo, right? But that's like the first one that kind of started this all, right? But I remember mm -hmm. like man, I had someone to mentor me or advise me in situations like this, right? Um, but if I could give like a tip or, you know, advice to students that I've gone through this or will go through this, I just want to have them remember that their presence is bigger than that person that's treating them in that, right? That their shine, mm -hmm intimidating um the way that they look is just too powerful for this individual that's treating them like this or giving them this level of disrespect right um it's hard because you do feel alone at that moment but you really aren't alone because now you're developing yourself your story of yourself but then now you get to 
bring the story with other members of your community and now you're rebuilding that story of what of the community right and how so many of us have gone through situations like that and that's why we just continue to be this powerful community especially as latinos and latinas like we constantly have to share space and remind each other and that's why it's awesome when you get mm -hmm. to meet other folks that are making it happen that are presidents of institutions now right you know mm -hmm. I mean, bank chancellor's offices like they're mm -hmm. todas, todas, like mm -hmm. but why and it continues to happen right like the, the three of mm -hmm. us right here i'm pretty sure we're gonna get to that level as well right if we're thinking about it or not phd but that's always an option for us right especially in higher mm -hmm. settings um but to go back to the initial question like try your best to not feed into the voices that are trying to, mm. I think yeah. that's where we lose ourselves. And just in order for you to don't lose yourself, just remember that whatever you have right here, your heart, mm -hmm. your name, like that's gonna shine way harder than that voice that's right here. And that's not even a real mm. voice. That's not yeah. even a real voice. Dang, that's real. That is real. That is so real. No, and I definitely agree as someone who's still I for our, our students of like that imposter syndrome, that voice, it just doesn't it it doesn't go away, at least for me of like, it, yes, it comes in waves. Right. And it's like, OK, you feel you feel good. Right. That you have advanced you. Right. Whether it's transferring from a community college right into a UC CSU private school right and then once you've graduated now you're entering the professional space and it's navigating a whole other set of rules right and then questioning of like do I belong here right was this just how do you stay true to your own values being authentic to my own Latinidad, right? And um, it can be really intimidating, I think, especially these predominantly white spaces, right? Whether it's in school or professionally, right? And I think we face a lot of pressures to conform to a certain standard of way of being, of looking, of talking, right? So thank you, a lot of powerful gems. And I think it is powerful when you're in community with one another, you realize of like, yeah, I am, you know, like we have power and magic within ourselves, right? And um, no one can take that away from us, that our people, wow, like we are some powerful people, our ancestors, right? Like they fought so hard, are so resilient and that lives within you, right? And no, a bully in class or no teacher is gonna tell me who I am you know what I mean like so it's things like that but I know it's hard I think as you're in that moment because I'm definitely one of like Martin as you were sharing I'm like yeah I would have been the person of like yeah I'm gonna not talk I'm not gonna speak up in class that would have been my character development moment but I'm probably like I think about it of like yeah there would have been other experiences to like right like build that confidence up again and yeah. yeah so it's I think of like staying true to your values being authentic to yourself and um I, yeah I guess how and you've mentioned this around like your Latinx identity influencing your academic professional pr pursuits in higher education but anything more or consejos around that for students as they're kind of um navigating these different spaces how do they how they can embrace that latinidad identity yeah um i think i want to say it's a lot um for personally like you mentioned that right, we come through our ancestors fought so hard and we can't come through this mm -hmm. powerful um right, whatever that may be um our roots are rooted on this planet on this earth mm -hmm. right? um and there's many spaces where I think our our culture isn't as celebrated mm -hmm. or washed down. And if I can tell any students, right, and not only Latinos and Latinas, but any student that has um, a beautiful part of their identity, whether that be their sexual preference, their orientation, mm -hmm. religion, yeah. um, affiliation, gender, right? Um, 
is to make sure that you are letting folks know who you are. It's yeah. so important to not only remind people, but also reclaiming whatever space you're in and reminding folks that even mm -hmm. though I'm queer and Latino, I'm gonna make sure I'm still here. And if it's in a predominant mm -hmm. heterosexual or, or you know white space, whatever it may mm -hmm. be, right? like it's so important to reclaim space and make sure your presence yes. it's celebrated, it's remembered, right? Because yeah. we don't. I feel like not only I, I'll I'll just speak with me. It took me a long time to get there, right? Um, yeah. To I felt like if I were to constantly remind people that I'm Latino or Mexicano or Chicano from SF, like it would get kind of repetitive. But mm -hmm. I realized that you have to because there's someone else in the room that's going to relate to you, that's going to mm -hmm. connect. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to build that sense of bond and community. It's important. It's yeah. important. so important. Comunidad is so important. Yeah, that, so yeah. important. You know, struggling right now to you know, figure out their their sense of identity of belonging. I just mm -hmm. want to remind them to take their time, right? Every mm -hmm. everything takes time, right? Um, they shouldn't rush figuring out who they are or what they are. Mm. But it's getting to know at least the, the areas that they do know and are comfortable mm -hmm. with, being able to claim it and name it, right? And then to just develop from there. I think our we all have a very unique journey. Um mm -hmm. In different spaces, right? In different paces too. Mm -hmm. um, but we all also have all these wonderful intersectionalities that make us who mm -hmm. we are. And I don't think exactly. a lot of us are really encouraged to, you know, own that or name it or mm -hmm. recognize it, right? Like I think when we're looking at physical appearances, we're like, okay, able-bodied person, um, mm -hmm. you know, most likely, um, male presenting, identifying, et cetera. But once you kind of break down those layers, there's so much more to you, right? Um, exactly. And I don't want students to feel like they're just another stereotype. Um, mm -hmm. Forty of us may be first gen, but that's wonderful though. At least the generations after us, they can now mm -hmm. relate. They're gonna have their own mm -hmm. system. My parents were first generation too, right? Like, and now it's mm -hmm. like, continuing with our education um yeah. you know there's little things like that you have to think about or remember like that like mm -hmm. I, no one's really ever alone in their sense of identity or yeah. in this like aspect right but i do want to mm -hmm. remind us that like you said too um Angelica, i love that we get to that we all have this beautiful sense of magic mm -hmm whether that be artistically, whether that be academically, mm -hmm. whether that be leadership roles. Um, if any student is out there that feels stuck, just, you know, go with your endeavor. And mm -hmm. something that one of my greatest mentors has told me um, when I was feeling at my lowest in education, um, in higher education, she told me, don't be afraid to be great. Mm -hmm. With me for over a decade, and yeah. even in those moments where I feel like mm -hmm. out or I, you know, I'm I'm giving too much power to that little voice. Mm -hmm. I get reminded by that quote, like "Don't be afraid to be great." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's so beautiful, Marty. I'm really glad that you know you, well, your your willingness to to be vulnerable with us and to share your experience and stories. Um, and I think there's a couple of different themes that, you know, have been popping up throughout our conversation that I really want to highlight, right? And the this this theme of the importance of representation and community, especially mm -hmm. as uh as students, right? Um, as uh people going through higher education or or just spaces in general, right? Once you get to that profession to the professional world, you know, you're gonna have to navigate all these different things as well. But mm -hmm. knowing that there are like those those outlets and those opportunities for you to feel that power with other folks, right? Um, and it, it kind of leads us to to our final question that you know I kind of hope that you can speak to this a little bit, right? Um, especially just you know listening to to your story, it, it was bringing up a lot of emotions for me because you know I'll be honest with y'all, like 
higher education, education in general wasn't always like my forte, right? I barely graduated from high school. You know, I transferred or, or I transitioned into community college and like the first couple of years, like I failed and would withdraw. And like those voices were really strong at that point in my life telling me like, the, you're not good at this, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the, this isn't for you. So to be here in this position and to be able to share space with you and be uh, in this professional capacity is, is amazing. But it did take, you know, um, one of my my mentors, my longtime mentors, um, was uh, you know a, a person of color that you know was able to take those you know doubts and help me see the the strength and the power and, and that voice within myself. Right. So I'd love to hear from you, Martin, if you could just share with our viewers a little bit about you know uh, how they can build that community and how they can find that representation here on campus. You know, maybe if you want to share uh, your info or, you know, um, be, be that outlet. But, you know, I, I think that it'd be really important just so our viewers get a sense of what's, what Skyline has to offer them. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome question. Um, I think for any student that's looking for their community, right? Just don't be afraid to go look for it or mm -hmm. even create your own community, right? Um, I think that's what we did with Comunidad. There was just mm -hmm. a, there was a strong need to build community with other Latinx professionals on campus, right? Especially during the pandemic. I think that's what really, oh. made me, or like there's so many Latinos and Latinos professionals on campus yet we do not know each other. Um, and thankfully, you know, when we were able to come back slowly but surely in person, that's where this idea came about. Like, let's just start having like little hangouts after after um, work, right? After 4.30. Yeah. And it just grew from there. Um, you know, we, a lot of people became closer colleagues. Um, we started to get excited about more hangouts. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we applied for the PIF, uh, which we were granted last year. And that's what helped us create and develop um uh, the latinx the latinx uh graduation celebration skyline's first ever right so mm -hmm. a big moment um and now we're now thankfully we have csc which is the community student club but it all comes from these ideas right and mm -hmm. seeing what your ideas could look like right it just started as a conversation between me and another colleague on zoom and then we just sent out emails to other Latinx identifying professionals on campus mm -hmm. and that happened and then the graduation happened and then the mm -hmm. happened. so I want to just encourage students to either either create the community or just go find it mm -hmm. um, you know I of course I want to be an outlet you know with being someone that thankfully co-founded Pumian that at Skyline but also you know advises CSC I have so many I have so many plans for that student club because it's so necessary for our students, right? Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that we have BBS. Um, I think that's something that's very fruitful and growing for our um, our male uh, students of color. And thankfully I'm part of that as well. And I wanna be a mentor for that. But for the Latinos and Latinas on campus, especially in Promise, um, you know, mm -hmm. I want to encourage them to join CSC. Yeah. Our president is a wonderful individual. His name is Tango Bautista. And again, that was an idea with him and I too, right? Like, how can mm -hmm. we build this and how can we develop it so that it, it's a strong, um, not a strong force on campus, but, you know, a strong community on campus because there's so many Latino and Latina students and they need mm -hmm. this too. You know, I want to one day, like, for the future, I want Skyline to develop its own center for, like, you know, LASA, LASA students. Mm -hmm. right? Latino, yeah. Latinas, right? That would be incredible uh, with yeah. resources, right? With their own counselors, with classes, with everything. Like, I, I see it happen in the near future. But again, that's just an idea, right? That we can yeah. do. That's it. Oh, she has do it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. students are more exactly. than welcome. Let's do it. <laughs> students are more than welcome to email me to come see me at the UC, oh. you know, and hopefully at 
future uh, CSC uh, Comunidad Student Club meetings, you know, I would love yeah. to see that expansion go crazy as well. And for yeah. any students that are graduating, we do hope to also have the second, you know, uh, graduation. graduation. And that's so, um, that's only, you know, it's all built from ideas. So. Yeah. And exactly, it's like that community piece, right? Of like, it starts in as idea, but then we uplift and get together. And that I think is the beauty of our people. We make things happen, right? And um, well, thank you so much, Martin, for joining us, for sharing your story. So many gems. I know I'm going to carry this energy with me. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, like so many other ideas that want to share with our students that know that you are not alone in this journey, that you can reach out to any of us. There's so many resources. And like Martin said, you either create it or you look for it, right? Because it does exist on campus and definitely excited to keep this conversation going. Uh, but that concludes our first Platica Poderosa, Poderosa Platica. Um, thanks so much, y'all. And thank again, so much, Nova. Martin. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you to you too.